Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Human Behavior Podcast. Join us this week for an eye-opening conversation with Dr. Kenneth Trump, a renowned authority in school safety with a distinguished career spanning more than 40 years. Dr. Trump takes us on a compelling journey from his early days tackling gang issues in Cleveland schools to becoming a pivotal figure in school safety consulting. Learn how his academic background in social services and public administration laid the foundation for his relentless commitment to integrity and practical solutions in the school industry. During the episode, Dr. Trump shares some interesting insights into the world of school safety, including the influence of private equity and aggressive lobbying by security vendors that often lead school administrators astray. Dr. Trump also explains why flashy high-tech security measures might not be the silver bullet they're marketed to be, and why fundamental practices often get neglected. He shares real-life examples and lessons learned from historical tragedies that underscore the importance of human factors, training, and communication over costly gadgets. We also tackle the complexities of school safety funding, especially in a post-COVID world, and we discuss the critical roles of various school staff from bus drivers to custodians in maintaining a secure environment. Towards the end of the show, we get into the rising trend of holding parents accountable for school shootings, with recent cases shedding light on this controversial issue. Through our dialogue with Dr. Trump, we emphasize the need for leadership, community involvement, and effective training to foster a balanced and sustainable approach to school safety. Don't miss this insightful episode packed with expert knowledge and practical advice. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the episode and please check out our Patreon channel where we have a lot more content as well as subscriber only episodes of the show. Enjoy the podcast. We'll kindly ask that you leave us a review and more importantly, please share it with a friend. Thank you for your time and don't forget that training changes behavior. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for uh, tuning in to this week's show. We've got a very uh, special guest by the name of Dr. Kenneth Trump. But before I actually let him introduce himself, I do have to make a, a little note. T- today's, uh, uh, today's episode is sponsored by Big O Tires in Montrose, Colorado, where Greg is at right now. Because uh, to get new tires for his FJ, for for those of you unfamiliar with where Greg lives high up in the Rocky Mountains, he has to like go through a pass, uh, ask a guy several questions uh, or someone asks him several questions and he gets on like a floating raft across a river. And it's like a Monty Python episode. It it really, really is. So, um, so uh, Greg is is mobile today, but we have good connection, everything. So we're good. But um, I know we got a little bit of an intro uh, to our special guest today. First of all, Dr. Ken Trump, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're excited to talk to you today. Yeah, great being with you guys. Follow your work. And it uh, seems like we have a lot of thoughts in common. Appreciate the invitation. We- yeah, we do. We had a, for those of us too, we had a great call a couple of weeks ago with some of our folks, our team and talk to you because it's the same thing. We've been been following you on, on LinkedIn, especially and reading a lot of your work. And so um, if you could, for our listeners, just to start out, give a little bit about your background in school safety and then kind of what you're doing right now, because it's important. I want people to know that you've been in this for a while, right? You're not a suddenly new subject matter expert on school shootings. But so if you could give us a little bit of your your background and what you're working on now. Yeah, appreciate it. And usually when I start presentations on conferences nationally, I say I'm going to start by answering the background question that everybody really wants to know with 40 years of experience in school safety, a, a doctoral degree, decades of experience of working with school shootings, answer the number one question that's on people's mind, no relation. <laughs> <laughs> that's it's not important, the first. It's it's the important most, to get that up front. The elephant in the room, really. It's, yep. it's a great ice for prayer. It's not a political statement. And uh, everybody usually laughs because they're going, yeah, that's really what we really wanted to know. Okay, now let's, <laughs> yeah. now let's get into the material. Uh, so, yeah, I actually uh, literally started in junior high school. Uh, I started in, in Cleveland schools. They had, uh, at the time, 19, late 1970s, they had court-ordered crosstown, uh, federal or court-ordered busing uh, due to racial desegregation order, uh, inequities uh, in court over academics, crosstown busing, and part of that created a division of safety and security. So I was a Cleveland school student setting in, and and for those of us who were uh, mature enough, not old, mature enough to remember high school typing class or junior high typing class. Anybody actually, I guess it's keyboarding now. I'm not even sure what it is now. I don't think Uh, they even do that now. Yeah. So guy walks in the room with the two way radio goes back to the teacher and I get called back and I'm going, wait a minute, what did I do? You know, she said, uh, uh, Mr. Connor wants you to type his duty report. (laughs) He says, she says, you're the fastest typer and do the best job. 
I mean, who is this guy? What's this about? Well, that led to free pizza there because they owned a pizza shop on, on the side. Uh, and uh, went on, and did his reports, uh, went on to high school, used to hang out in the security office there, do their investigation and duty reports. More pizza, a little pay under the table at that time. A few bucks for a high school kid. And um, the rest turned to, it out to be history. The day I graduated, the deputy principal said, you're not going anywhere. Hang over here while you're going to work on your on your bachelor's degree at Cleveland State. I got a bachelor's in social service, criminal justice concentration. I uh, went on to, uh, while I was still working in Cleveland District to get a uh, master's in public administration. And while I was in the schools, get developed especially with gangs. We had rival youth gangs, one of the unintended consequences of mixing kids rival neighborhoods with the crosstown busing wasn't academics it was they mixed rival gangs so we'd have gang riots in schools developed a specialty doing that uh really got into working with the the gangs ended up creating a five-person team with 127 schools seventy-three thousand kids strictly working on gangs for the school district anywhere from tell- talking to second graders on why they shouldn't Join gangs and dealing with parents to mediating disputes that were leading up to a drive-by shooting, threats at, at dismissal, to actually the street enforcement investigations in cooperation with Cleveland Police. So we caught a lot of attention to that. Got a little side business doing training. Uh, worked in a suburban school district for three years um, as a director of security for the school district there, assistant director of a federal-funded anti-gang task force, and then just uh, went out on my own. Uh, it got a little fed up with the corruption in school politics at the point in time and decided uh, to maintain my integrity and my uh, freedom of life and not mixing in uh, some of the politics of, of some of the dynamics that were going on. Took a part-time gig into a full-time business and uh, now 40 years of doctoral degree and later. Uh, here we are doing school security and it's a lot more complex than what it's been. So I had a great opportunity to work from the Aleutian Islands of Alaska with one school, 125 kids, to Miami-Dade, Chicago Public, uh, large, some of the largest districts, and uh, enjoy doing security assessments, emergency planning, training. And then, as we'll talk about, I'm sure a little bit more uh, expert witness work, civil litigation. I've worked on the mass shootings, on the lawsuits, uh, rape, other sexual assaults, gang violence, and that type of stuff. So really weird background, weird mix. Uh, But uh, that's where I was meant to be. Brian, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to add one thing. Cleveland's only a, a couple hours uh, directly south of Detroit. And I spent a lot of my formative years, first of all, in the mid-60s with busing in Detroit. So I, I understand that reference. And then second part is Cleveland hosted the Apple Pit, A-P-P-L-E Pit, which was the Police Institute for Tactical Training. So I bet uh, during some of those years that we probably passed each other uh, probably going back the, and forth. That's amazing the, to me. In the same room, we used to do a lot of law enforcement conferences. Actually, one of the Cleveland yep. PD guys and I formed the uh, – Ohio chapter of the Midwest Gang Investigators Association dealt with McLaughlin and all that. Uh, yeah, just uh, that whole network uh, got involved right. with the suburbs with some federal grants. So I got on the uh, the speaking circuit with those different federal conferences. So interesting mix of public safety, law enforcement, and uh, education, which is uh, uh, not necessarily an easy blend. No, but it's actually no. in this work. Yeah. Y- yeah, I, w- I would say um, I appreciate you you sharing that experience. And, and to add what I my opinion to that is probably why you have the perspective that you do, um, not just a long history of being in the schools, but dealing with things like that with different, you know, gang issues and, you know, just the normal crime that schools, especially larger school systems and in, in larger major pet- metropolitan areas have to have to deal with. Um, and so it, it, and the reason why I wanted for, for our listens, why I wanted you to cover all that stuff too, is because, um, you know, now because of this epidemic of school shootings that continues to occur, we've got all these experts coming out, got people trying to sell different technologies and, you know, it's, it's all very well intentioned for the most part, for most people involved in it. There's a lot of people just trying to make a buck, which, which I get, but, um, you know, having a good foundational understanding of what schools really face is important because that's what people forget in all this it's like we're going after these uh, low frequency but highly impactful events but there's all of these other problems too that most 
teachers typically have to deal with and what all schools have to deal with that kind of all fit into this process that you, you can't leave that on the table, meaning we can't focus on just one thing without having some sort of comprehensive plan of how we're dealing with everything. So and a lot of folks just don't have that, that background knowledge. They, you know, they're not, they're not aware of what teachers are facing on a daily basis, really at, at most of the time and how that impacts, you know, their ability to, um, to keep kids safe. It's such a but, unique environment. I mean, it's you got to understand school climate, school culture, school community relations, and most of all, school politics or yep. politric, politics, as I call it. Second, yeah, the first books of politics of school safety because you know you can get the most decorated person with the background in, in the military and and uh, law enforcement. You know, captains, chiefs, deputy chiefs, come into a, a job as director of school security. And figure, you know what, I dealt with a lot of this at the, you know, at the local or county level or wherever they work. I dealt with bureaucracy and politics and they come into a school district like, OK, this is a whole different world. It's organizational it structure, uh, not paramilitary, para, you know, highly structured. Uh, the chief says do this, you do it. No, we do collaboration here. We're going to form teams. We're going to have consensus or not. And, and you know, I always used to joke the process sometimes becomes more important than uh, <laughs> than product over the long end. It's like, so it, it, it's a whole, you have to be able to manage that. And, and working with schools, I always say, I'm a three-part consultant. One is security and emergency planning. Now, that's really the easiest part. We know what the best practices are. We know what needs to be done. Second part is communications. It's a highly ambiguous, uncertain at times, a lot of anxiety, the worst that I've seen, highest level I've seen with parents about school safety in 40 years. Um, and and you've got there's a huge communication component, too. So so that's the second piece. And the third part is political. It's a political issue. Image maintenance, uh, denial for in many cases over the years uh, of problems. We didn't have gangs in Cleveland schools. I had a superintendent who said we had organized youth student group misconduct. <laughs> so I'm going, oh, okay, go. that's pretty good. Hey, and when, so I went to the su- yeah, so when I went to the suburbs, I ta- I said, okay, we don't have drug dealers here. We have pharmaceutical distribution specialists in the suburban <laughs> educational setting. Now that the BS is done, <laughs> let, let's, let's get down to dealing with the problem. But that's the environment you have to work in, right? It's two thirds of this dynamic is, is, is dealing with the, the communications and the political context. And, and to get to be able to do what you need to get done on the on the security and emergency planning and the best practices. So, so on that, what what are the the biggest problems that you see in in when it comes to school safety? I know that obviously everyone's talking about school shootings, and we just had another one recently. But you know what what are the big problems? What are the the things that bother you about? Because it's an industry now, right? I mean, it's it's a there's a whole there's there's lobbyists, there's big companies doing stuff. There's you know uh, school administrators who kind of had weren't used to dealing with this kind of stuff a while ago and then are just going, okay, well, you guys must be the experts, you know, you tell us. So I'm just, I want to get your perspective on what you think the the biggest problems are. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a long list. So I'll try to, you know, as we were talking about, let's try to narrow it down to the top three. And T- top three. Some, if you got them. Yeah. yeah. That could take an hour or two on, on its own. Yeah. The, the biggest, most current problem is the whole issue of, um, uh, the security vendor hardware product technology uh, marketing is on steroids. Uh, it's fueled by private equity in many cases, and it's uh, and it's driven in some cases by lobbyists. These firms are hiring. They're going to state legislatures, lobbying on behalf of their product, trying to get funding shake, uh, shaken loose for what they sell. Uh, no coincidence. Uh, two governors actually vetoed line items uh, for one particular uh, bill because it was so narrowly written it only fit the the description of the uh, of the one vendor whose lobbyists were doing the doing the lobbying uh so and and then it's and then uh, so that has taken over in the last i'd say you know three to five years it's had a dramatic impact school administrators are saying i can't cut through the noise that same phrase that we hear over and over again which i I know you guys can relate to is 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 cannot cut through the noise. They're bombarded with vendors. Uh, there there are four groups of people that I say, uh, generally speaking, broadly speaking, giving advice. Number one, there are activists, some who may take a you know a gun control versus gun rights type social or political agenda. That's one group, and and school safety is being used as a peg for that. Second part are advocates 
We have a number of parents who've lost kids, former school administrators, people who are, have a, a particular single incident experience. Uh, and I respect that and, and respect their advocacy. And many will tell you that they're doing what they do and now giving speeches and tours is for their, it's part of their grieving process. But the question becomes, where does grieving and, and, and advocacy stop and where does policy and funding begin? Mm-hmm. And that line's getting really blurred and not necessarily for the best interest right. because there's money comes, uh, plays a, a, in some role directly or indirectly with that. The third area is, is uh, you know, experts and experts, you know, if you're looking at a court perspective, it's uh, qualified in court and it's education, training and experience constitute experts. And that could be many people from many different perspectives. And then the fourth part is sort of opportunists. <laughs> it's the last bucket. Um, uh, people who, who, who see, uh, you know, are trying to put the, the round uh, peg into the square hole or vice versa, however you want to call it. Um, and it just doesn't fit, but they're trying to, to jump in, see some opportunities or what they believe to. So you've got all, all this noise going on and principals and superintendents are telling us we can't figure, you know, we can't cut through the noise. And that's the impact. Either they're acting and act, making decisions going down the wrong route for things or they're, what I'm increasingly seeing is they're freezing and saying, I'm just I'm done. I can't do anything. So that's the, the number one problem, most recent trend. Uh, the second part of that is, is related to, to our conversations is if you look at the civil litigation, the expert witness work, and I was talking with a reporter about this earlier. I said, well, when you talk about that, people think automatically well, you're, you're helping. Well, people are worried about getting sued. Well, nobody wants to get sued. Uh, but if somebody's sued, it means uh, somebody has been hurt or killed. And if somebody's hurt or killed, and we might feel what we're talking about is we're talking about kids or, or maybe teachers and staff members. So what do we learn from that? And having worked on some of the highest profile mass shootings in schools and single incident, wrongful deaths, rape, other sexual assault, while the facts and merits vary, the common thing is that the allegations of failures are failures of human factors, people, policies, procedures, yeah. training, communications, systems gaps. They're not failures of hardware products and technology. So we're spending all this effort with target hardening. There's a political piece to that. Target hardening is being used by elected officials now to counter calls for uh, gun control. This, it, this, there's a huge agenda here in framing these issues. So people come yeah. out after a school shooting politically and say, oh, we need gun control, though the counter to that is now we need target hardening. So it, there's a ploy here. There's money involved with all and all of these dynamics going on. But the key is it goes back to people. And if we're skewing our funding and, and our and our lobbyists and our, and our legislative mandates to target hardening, and we're doing less and less on the human factors and the people end, and then we wonder why we're still having the problems. Yeah, and that, that leads to so many different issues. And, you know, we always refer to it, too, as like sort of this diffusion of responsibility. It's like, okay, well we've got this thing that we've got now we've got these panic buttons we've got this you know up armored whatever we got bulletproof this and it's like okay but that that doesn't necessarily one that's not going to prevent and stop anything it it, it may at it's it's that what we call at bang thinking right it's it's when when so what you're doing is you're saying this is if this happens or we're assuming this is going to happen, here's how we're going to better manage a problem that we think is going to happen. It's like, well, you don't have to let it happen. Like, I mean, th- th- this is the biggest thing is and, and what I see, too, is like, yeah, like you said, you, you nailed it with different administrators. Like, OK, I, I don't know. All these people are pounding on my door. They're showing up saying this. They have impressive resumes, um, you know, or, or at least I think they do. I mean, that, that's always the thing I, I always tell people, too, because I can, you know, being prior military myself. Self, it's like, hey, just because you have some tier one guy coming in here to tra- train you and like, yeah, they're amazing at what they do and they had an incredible career, but that doesn't apply here, like in the least bit. And and so, but we, we sort of attribute these sort of skills or knowledge to people that don't really have it. And, you know, here you're saying, even with the data shows that these are th- these are sort of human centric or human problems and and those things can be fixed meaning i don't have to build a better mousetrap i don't have to have a better technological response you know we can use the resources that we have and the people that we have and i mean uh, cuz i was talking to recently to to uh, uh, someone who's safety in school as well is like well you have a population here that works here that i'm pretty sure they didn't become a teacher or an educator or involved in education because 
they wanted to make a ton of money or they want to do something like they're here because they care, like their heart's in the right place. So why wouldn't you want to capitalize on that and use those folks who are already caring about what they do and, and the students that they have to, to build this sort of network? So I, I know, Greg, you, you probably had yeah, something it, to add, too. It, 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 and, and Ken, quickly from my side, here's the thing. Both of us have spoken to Congress. Both of us have spoken to congressional subcommittees. I can go all the way up to Department of Defense uh, leaders and everything. And when you come in as a subject matter expert, they want to know what the problems are and how to address them as solutions. And the problem is that sometimes lobbyists have much more pro uh, uh, power over us. And I talked to Brian yesterday with a client. If you take a look at hockey gear over the years, when I started playing hockey, there were no helmets. You were lucky if you had a mouthpiece. Uh, uh, when we look at cop work, when I started, bullet resist uh, resistant vests weren't issued. Nobody wore them uh, 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 until much later. And then Kevlar came out and did the test and people started wearing them. And then they were worn under your uniform shirt. Now they're worn outside like a body bunker. Then we take a look at football helmets. They've never been a better generation of football helmets. And you know what? It didn't solve any of the issues. Now, it may have... Uh, 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 made less severe traumatic brain injuries, but cops are still getting shot in the head, whether they're wearing a vest or not. And I'm looking at that like the, the paintbrush and the old Tom Sawyer, you know, hey, uh, look, we're whitewashing the fence. We're doing something. But at the end of the day, and you said it last time we talked, Ken, you said, we've got to shake up this industry because people are no longer listening. They think they're pointing at the problem. They think that they've uh, uh, proposed a solution. And in reality, all we're doing is marking time until the next shooting. So I, I throw that out there is a the turd in the punch bowl so to speak well it is and you know if you hit if you're hitting the panic button and that's your answer to everything well if you're panicking you're too late yeah. <laughs> you hit the button Amen. Pan you hit the panic button when you're panicking and you know and again follow the money the golden rule yes sir who's behind who's behind the drive for the panic buttons uh you know th more to be seen but you can rest assured there's a, a an industry the cottage industry and, and profit there as well and and then what happens is, you know, you have people who are well-intended and grieving and they're advocating the state's mandate that every school as a parent, well, you know, politically, nobody's got, everybody wants to listen to this person that's lost their, their, kid, their kid's Certainly. life. And I agree. And, and, but where is that the best use of limited resources to mandate hey, If schools want to buy it and they've got the funds, go for it. But are we for, what are we forcing people to do? And the same right. with emergency plans. I really think we're over legislating school safety now to the point where you're putting principals and superintendents more in an office where they're checking the box and going through routines and saying that they're in compliance, yeah. filling out 20, 85 page templates. I mean, you guys will appreciate this more than perhaps most uh, people will. You know, some of these emergency plans we're reviewing 85 to 125 pages now. Nobody from the custodian to the superintendent knows what's in there. And there's one superintendent who had a shooting in his school, now retired superintendent, said it best. Um, he says, you know, when the bullets start flying, no, but we're not grabbing the crisis plan. He says, he says, it's, if we looked at it, talked through it, uh, got went through it as teams, processed this, get some as we would say, shared mental models on this stuff beforehand. He says that part helps. He goes, but when the stuff hits a fan, that's we're not going to the to, to the plan. And the problem is we're going through the motions of doing something just like just like you say, Greg. It's it's doing you know going through the motions of, of yes, painting sir. that painting that fence. Hey, I've got a plan, and it's, it's that state approved it, and it sent it to him, and it's like eighty five pages. Fence. Yeah, exactly. and it's, yeah, it's a good one. You know, it used to be before the digital world. You know, it's a red binder. It's not only a binder; it's a red right. binder up right. on yourself. Uh, and we have one, and it's pretty. Um, and yeah, and you that, and then you start opening it up as we actually look at what's in there. And even when you have it, we're going. Why did you put that in there? That doesn't make sense or it's contradictory. And and who does it turn out to be good for? It, it's good for plaintiff's attorneys when they're suing you because they're, yeah, exactly. they will, you know, on page 74, a doctor so-and-so, I'm a superintendent, uh, it says that you shall do this. And now we've got one other thing. We've got, uh, you know, there's an effort by largely driven by consultants and, and security vendors um, through that are trying to create a, an industry standard. A, a, ASIS International now uh, create a safety committee, a school security committee, and it's a standard, and they're going to put this out there. It's over 100 pages, and by one word count, had more than 200 shells. Well, anybody that's done litigation work knows the difference between should and shall. Uh, exactly. puts you in some real tight, I'm not giving legal advice, but it puts you in a real tight spot in a yeah. position. 
So, so, and who's for people from outside the industry forcing things in under the industry without the ed, industry's input? And, and what I respect, you know, is like in our conversations, is there are transferable skills and ideas and behavior stuff that you guys are the experts in. That's total. And, and Dr. John Joe Johnson, we talked with uh, at length uh, just on her research. I mean, there's stuff out there that's transferable, that's new, exactly. that's shifting it up a little bit. Uh, and it's and it's not coming in a shining object for a, for ten million dollars that you can that put at your front entrance way that still doesn't catch the weapons that you claim it does. Yeah, that's the that's the think vice thing attitude, and you know that we all share that. And Joan is a wonderful resource for that with, with decades of experience uh, conducting studies and research. And and you know in this field. It's the least amount of study and research because there's such a small uh, uh, control group to measure, and every incident is so varied and different. And then you talk about the psychographic and the dynamics and all these other things, yet I've never seen a proliferation of more sub- so-called subject matter experts. And, and I think we need to say so-called because the idea is, you know, I stay in my lane. I'm the best in the world at one skill, and I can back that up with all my bona fides, but I don't comment on, on CNN, on, on fishing. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't go out there and purport myself to be an expert in other places. And you truly are, are the standard for what an expert needs to be in this field, and you're still competing for time with people that have no bona fides whatsoever whatsoever how did uh, that make you feel yeah well i i appreciate that and it, and it's the uh, you know there's room for different voices and i'm certainly not the only one out here but it's got to be uh, there it's 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 unbelievable uh you know the explosion of what i always say and i've seen this all the way back one of the advantages of being mature not like getting old is over four decades uh and starting young in this i've been here before uh, columbine jonesboro yeah. uh, arkansas paducah kentucky Pearl, Mississippi, ones that people don't even know about. Now, we don't even have know people about that them. are in Come schools on. that don't, they weren't even born, that are working in schools, weren't even born or, or at, at Columbine, uh, that are starting into the teaching and stuff, or weren't, weren't even, I shouldn't say weren't born, weren't uh, graduate from uh, high school at the time. Right. Uh, and, and they're entering, uh, you know, they're entering the field. So a lot of people really didn't live through these experiences, like 9-11, right? If you, you know, I, I went to the 9-11 uh, Memorial Museum with my daughter, who's a college junior, and two different experiences. We're going through it, had the same emotional impact on us. We spent hours there. We were emotionally drained. And we sat down uh, over at the pub down the street for, for lunch. And so, and I said, man, I said, I can remember exactly where I was sitting. I literally described it here. I was in my office here with who I named the two anchors who were on the, on cable when it was happening exactly moment by moment. And she looked up and she says, I'm emotionally drained. She says, and to think I wasn't even born <laughs> at this That's time, so amazing. you know, and it's, I said, this made me think of the school arena, right? There are people who haven't, didn't live through Columbine, uh, in the state, at least professionally in these positions. Um, and it's like starting, you know, it, 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 trying to reinvent the wheel, put the round peg in the square hole. It's just focus on the fundamentals, the things that we go into schools and ask on the consulting enter. A couple things. Number one, are you focusing on the fundamentals? Because you're looking for a PhD solution to, and you haven't passed kindergarten doing the basic things. You're talking about the AI weapons detection system, but your staff member's got a propped open door in the back and does that every day. And has a sign on the door. There was one school we were in. You can't high school after a second visit several years later. Great administration, great district leadership, but human behavior. Right? They they put a, a buzzer camera intercom on the custodial dock, and then the assistant superintendent here. I want to show you where we beefed this up based on your last recommendations. We walk back. There's a sign by the door. It says, "No one. Sh- you should never, ever, not just never, never, ever prop open this door." There's a door propped open with uh, some towels that have been laundered and a cart next to it propped open. Um, and I said, you know, it, it's still human behavior. You're opening up side doors. You put an AI weapons detection system, spends millions of dollars on these questionable AI yeah. systems and what they catch and what they don't catch and, and how they're marketed. Uh, and here, low-hanging fruit, you run them between 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. And then... Schools are open till 10 o'clock at night for athletic events, uh, performing arts, community use of the school. It's like low-hanging fruit, guys. You can come in here at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock and stash something if you wanted to. Come through clean tomorrow. It's security yeah. theater. It's smoke and mirrors. It's emotional security banquet, and it's done to pander 
to, to school to solve political and community relations problems, to appease parents, to give them a shiny object right. conundrum, to say that we've done something. And you spend more then, but as we've talked about, you create unintended consequences, right? And how yes. are you going to implement yep. this? Fidelity of implementation is, is a joke. You're pulling staff members from other areas of the building and they're not yep. monitoring hallways, classrooms, stairwells, where you've got bullying, sexual assault, harassment, fights going on. Um, it's critical thinking. I tell people when we go ahead and start a presentation, the first slide I have is, Unlike many other speakers that are kind of pay to play to get on on these conferences agendas, I said I only have one thing to sell you that I'm selling you: critical the concept of critical thinking. Right. Yep. And That's you've got to make critical it, thinking. It, and and um and this goes to you're bringing up some excellent points, and I I think um one of the problems is we you, the the problem. A lot of people don't understand this problem. They don't understand school shooters. They don't understand some of the stuff that happens. So it's like we're coming up with solutions to problems that don't exist or or, or won't help. And and I don't think that that problem has been clearly defined on how to do this. Um, and you brought up even even to the point of, of when it comes to these you know emergency manuals or different training manuals or threat management uh, things that we're going to do or uh, you know we, we want to develop a case on someone. Okay, you have to document certain things. Even the people that put that out, the experts, so to speak, the 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 researchers who've done all the work on this stuff, putting it together, they even state in this stuff like, look, this is not. A, this is not a checklist to find a school shooter. This, there's no such thing as a profile of a school shooter. Like they even state it right up front in their writing. They're going like, like here's some things you need to take into consideration. And it becomes again now it becomes like this is a paperweight. Like I, I open this, I read through it, eighty pages, and I like, what am I supposed to do with this? I got to write a report about something. I'm not an investigator. I'm no, I don't have law enforcement background. I'm a school administrator, and I've got three other jobs that I do for the school because I'm a coach and I do this. Like. It, and that's what it, but which makes it more difficult. But anywhere I've gone, you know, you have, we, we kind of forget that there's a whole community behind that school, whether some parents are going to be more involved than others, whether some teachers right. are going to be more involved, less. It's like you go back to like, why aren't we engaging these folks and then them telling us, here's what we need? Because even, even the Department of Defense has, has sort of done a different course with how they procure stuff and how they get new technologies, where before it was everyone just, you know, especially during the global war on terror and like the unlimited funding, people just coming up with stuff with the solutions and them going, oh, that's cool. Let's buy that. Let's buy that. Now they're like, hey, wait a minute. We got all this stuff. Like, let's just define what our requirements are, what our needs are. There's going to be companies that can solve the problem, right? They're going to come in and go, we want that DOD money. We're, we'll, we'll figure it out. So, and I don't think it's starting with that. Like it's, it's not coming from the school. It's not coming from what that community needs because, you know, some small school in the middle of nowhere, Georgia is going to be, their needs going to be very different than a Chicago public school, which has a host of other problems. I mean, so now it comes in with the legislation and that, that there's, no one size fits all it has to come from in there and then that's kind of one of the big things that i see occurring and then now it goes to those parents and administrators going like well i don't know or i got a buddy who was in the military and he works for this company and they've got this cool thing and it's it's pretty badass <laughs> so, so chen let me throw a part b in there before you answer so it'll be two sides of the same coin so you have an aed to to help defibrillate when a when a person is uh uh down uh how many for a school and and should they be on each floor of the school and how many per student? Well, they come out and, and CNN uh, or some other uh, talking head said about the Georgia shooting. Well, they only had one school resource officer. Every school should have three. OK, well, where does that funding come from and where does the training? What is the standard and are they armed or what happens is these pundits suggest things. And they've done zero research whatsoever. You've been in the field for four decades. So I would hope that some of them are coming to you and going, hey, you know, because I hate the term best practices. I think we all do. But the idea is that they at least come to you and go, what's a good plan? What's a what's a fidelity filled plan for the future? Yeah. And, and that's it. I mean, part of the dynamics is, well, there's so many pieces to this is, is right. you know, best practices is, is an education phrase. And really, um, what works uh and the problem it is is now they're trying to take these this create this industry standard and then take it through so they can 
uh, have an ANSI standard and uh, and then take it to what it is, is so that the lobbyists can take it to the state legislatures right. and then say, see, there's this quote unquote national or international standard and you need to codify this into law and mandate it. So now they're, you know, it's it's basically shoving it down schools' throats. So you're in the, and it's driven by hardware, product, and technology, and 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 security consultants. And no matter what they say, you may, you'll, you'll be some good people in the, the committee. Uh, I'm sure that it were well intended. I, I already know of a few that were, were on there. But the underlying push here, there's a bigger agenda, right? It's a bigger it, it, why now and why not ten years? Ago? Well, why now is right. because there's private equity, there's money, or there's a perception that there's money. Well, here's a little inside secret for anybody who's listening. Don't tell anybody. It's just going to be the three of us and everybody who's who's watching. Uh, guess what? The COVID pandemic funds money that the schools have been using to buy the shiny objects is done next year. Yep. It, it runs out in the next uh, by the, for the school fiscal year. So that little bucket of money that people have been dipping in and saying, hey, it's not coming from our operating budget, but I got 17 million over here. I can spend three million, buy some weapons detection system and some panic buttons, calm the parents and hey, you know what? Kick it down the road and, and, and hopefully it gets quiet. Wow. That's going out. And then the one time shot in the arm state grant, you look at the Georgia school shooting. One report said that the, it, the system for the panic buttons cost a million dollars for the school district where the incident occurred. Eight, according to the story, eight hundred thousand of that was provided by a state grant, and two hundred thousand was from the sheriff's uh, drunken driving ticket uh, fund. So you've got the school didn't pay a dime on that. Well, what's going to happen? for maintenance, repair, replacement, upgrade. We see this with everything, uh, you know, whether it's cameras, whether it's this type, you know, when that, like those, that one time shot in the arm funding has gone, is that's coming out of operating budgets Does it, in school districts that are cutting funds. It's not going to be there. So you're going to see, uh, you know, I have this vision of that was good, the deal with like weapons, the AI weapons detection screening at the front doors, that the hardware is leased, the software is subscribed. So what are you going to do when you can't afford both? I'm looking at a, a, right. a, rep- a repo truck coming in, hauling the hardware out, right? And you Because you can't pay your subscription and you haven't done it. So then what do you tell parents? You've given them right. a false sense of security. Now you have to explain why you're undoing or not doing what you sold them in the first place, which was a bill of emotional security, blanket security theater. And, and it comes down, as we know and, and, and agree on, it comes down to behaviors. Yes. Yes, Whatever absolutely. it is, it comes down to behaviors, whether that's left to bang, <laughs> during bang or after bang, uh, you're, you're dealing with behaviors. It's not a perfect science, but it's certainly there's information out there where we know a lot of science behind it that's not being tapped into. And we know that in the schools, the number one way you find out about weapons, plots and kids that are going to cause harm to themselves and others is from when a kid comes forward, tells an adult that it. they trust. It's a relationship, recognizing yep. abnormalities and behaviors. And and what I say, not only, you know, the see something, say something, I have a third one and train people to do something because if yep. you're seeing it and saying it and nobody knows what to do, your first two aren't doing you th- that much good because you've got to know what to do. Yeah, um, Brian famously it, brings that up uh, every class yeah. that, that we have this, you know, if you see something, say something, but what am I looking for and who do I tell? And right. and that's the problem is we don't put any emphasis whatsoever on the human behavior that uh, predictive analysis, the the things like uh, uh, that we recently wrote about the parking lot. Look, those are as good as these multi million dollar programs, or better, and nobody's taking a look at them. So, you know that that's our fight every day. Yeah, and, and we're in the same. We're fighting the same yep. fight. Di- different uh, different battlefield is that. Uh, although I think the two could come together, is, is yes. that is that you know. The best, the phrase I use, as you know, when you do media, you've got to talk in a soundbite because you only get 20 seconds, right? <laughs> to yeah. get across. It's really the, fir- the best security is, is, and, and safety for kids is less visible and invisible, but more impactful, mm-hmm. right? If you're focusing mm-hmm. on behavior, I can't dangle a relationship or a training or a behavior out in front of parents at a PTA meeting or in front of a news camera at a press conference and say, right. see, we've got something new we dealt with it. But I can do that with a weapons detection, more cameras, fortified front entranceway. But it's what's beyond that fortified entranceway that they pull behind it that'll make it or break it. I mean, your bus driver who's the first and last person to see a kid during a school day, who's going to tell yep. if something's off have no, there? Your teachers who are uh, your uh, your uh, secretaries in the office that are dealing, front office staff that are dealing with irate parents and people coming in and problems, strangers coming up to the to, to try to get to the building. 
your custodial, your facilities personnel. Who knows the building better than the principal? Your facilities personnel, your custodian exactly, yep. knows it. And then all, as we know, and we've talked, I talked with Joan, uh, you know, a little bit even longer about the research, just, you know, get a little wonky once you start getting into the academic world. Mm-hmm. So we, we like, we like to talk more about it and, and, and learn about it. You know, I, I had to laugh, you know, she said like, uh, you know, one, pra- one foot in, in academia, one foot in practice. We were talking about the, you know, um, just the people like Gary, Dr. Gary Klein, who we look yep. to for a lot of things. But if you can't put it in practice, what good is it? Right? What good is it? Yes. That's why I got an EDD applied doctorate because I want something to, to, you know, I looked at school administrators, strategic school safety leadership and communicating safety and highly ambiguous at certain times. So long, long, long thing, but how, how do you deal with it? How do you lead on it? And then how do you communicate uh, about it? Uh, right. And it still comes down to people. I mean, you, you hit on an interesting point. You talk about defining it. Uh, there, you know, by five years finished and through in a doctoral program dissertation, there is no standard definition of what a safe school is. Because nope. There, there are uh, many commonalities on the uh, agreements on the things that make yeah. up a safe school, the components, but you can't just blurt out a line of, of say, this is what a, a safe school is. I, and matter of fact, that we've gone through that on what's a mass shooting, right? What's a school shooting? Right. <laughs> there's there's yeah. some debates on that. Yeah. Oh, if it was on, you know, the it was during the football game on Friday night. Does that count? Like, yeah, you're right. you're getting into to all these areas, and and you, you know, you're you're tying it back to, and what I think it is is, um, you know, the what what can these administrators and community members and parents do? Because I I th- I believe in starting at the the you know the local level. Look, I'm never going to change national policy, but I can affect my neighborhood. I can affect my my school district that my kids go to, um, and and that's that's the biggest thing. And what I talk to different school administrators about is that. Typically what happens is, you know, there's a school shooting or something. Everyone reaches out like you know, a lot of people will reach out and say, is there yep. something I can do or I'm concerned about this? So people are there. We've had we've worked with folks who are trying to stand up like, you know, a parent led, you know, almost like a neighborhood kind of watch for the school where they all volunteer their time. But then you get into just the pure bureaucracy of it about what you can and can't do at a school. And now we got to do background checks on people because now we're opening it up to people outside who've been vet, who haven't been vetted. So it's like it, it, there, there's a lot of different these barriers that, that come in the way. And so what can those schools do to, to say, you know what, this is this is how we're going to do things or we want to do it this way because I think their voice is is sort of more powerful in a sense because they know their community better. So it's like, what are they supposed to do? Is I'm a dad, I'm a teacher, I'm whatever. Like, what can I do right there in my district? Well, we talk about that expertise that you develop by being there every day. And, you know, that whole idea, I, I try to get across to educators, as much as I do what I do, you're the expert at your school. You know what, you know, that pattern recognition and abnormalities, right? <laughs> right up your alley here. What, you know, starts, a, you know, right, kid getting on a bus. What's, you know, kids, something's off. This is not the same kid I see every day in terms of behavior arrival and dis- dismissal, being out greeting kids, observing, calling kids by name, engaging with them in the hallway, the people piece of it, uh, it is, is, is extremely important. The problem, challenge is the uh, only thing school administrators have less of than money is time. Yeah. Getting on the agenda. And I know that, the, you know, I was talking with Joan about this uh, in, in her years of, of work and your years of work is you have a great programs, you have great training, you have research based stuff, you know, it'll work, you know, it'll help people meet their mission. And you still can't get on the agenda. I had a superintendent call me after the Uvalde shooting here uh, in the Midwest. And so, and of course, after the Uvalde shooting, I had eight requests across three states in three weeks to do training. You want to guess how many I had the year before or the year after? It wasn't yeah. eight. It wasn't yeah. eight. I've had eight calls yep. from attorneys and lawsuits <laughs> during that time period, but not for training. But the, he says, how much time do you need? And I said, and, and he'd seen me speak when he was assistant superintendent somewhere. And I said, well, truth is, I, I need at least a day to lay foundation and really get to where to plant some seeds and give something to people go with. And I said, but I know you're not going to give that to me. And I said, so. I'd like at least a half a day. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I really hope to get two hours out of this. Right. Uh, and he says, I'll pay you for the full day. You've got 40 minutes. There you and go. It, and it's a three-day leadership team. 
Yep. Or leadership retreat, rather, with building administrators, central office administrators, your board members. So he's a good guy. And, and we talked for a while. And, and it happened to talk. I, my, I was sitting out in the school parking lot. My daughter was attending a, a, a Sunday play performance. And I'm eating a, a Philly cheesesteak <laughs> waiting for her. I'm talking with the soup. We had enough time on that Sunday to talk. We went back and forth for about an hour just talking about the focus of things. He gave me and finally said, all right, I'll give you an hour and a half. And he and they, and when it was done, they said, and I mean, I may you know you know how it is. You make it work, right? And when it was done, he says, you know, it's the best thing that we did. He says, you never would have made it for forty minutes. So, it, so the, the point is, it's a leadership issue. It's not a money issue. If it comes from the board, it comes from the superintendent. It comes from your building principal. It becomes a priority, right? And so you have yeah. to make it a leadership issue to say this is a priority, and to keep it uh, on the agenda. And so, and those who do. Those who get it, get it. And and I think we're right. working on it, but it's small wins. Look, I was in a county school district in West Virginia last month, and the superintendent said, uh, said I know it's a big ask, but can you do six 50-minute back-to-back presentation? 50-minute, 10-minute break, 50, 10-minute break, and lunch in between. And I said, yes, not realizing that, uh, you know, I'm not 40 anymore and my legs may have had it. And then got a three hour drive home, may have had a different yeah. opinion on the situation, but knocked it out. But the cool thing about it was it was everybody from custodial facility people, bus drivers, all the way up to assistant superintendents, superintendents, and everybody in between. They were rotating all their employees through a series of six different back to school training options. So everybody got through. Uh, and, and it's the most, you know, it's the most impactful thing you do. You get people, you do the best you can. I knocked it out in 50 minutes. You hit the core of things, tell them, look, I know you've got to have your manual, but let's talk about, <laughs> you know, situational awareness st- stuff, uh, that's a, pattern recognition. And then the big one, cognitive decision-making under stress, because educators are good at recognizing the abnormalities yeah. and patterns. Yes. We're struggling with getting people to be fully present and su- engaging and supervised. I had a, a superintendent tell me, I need you to come in to do a, a training. I'm going, well, what do you want me to hit? What's your, what, what do you want out of this? So I can see how to make sure I, I blend it in, in terms of focus. He said, I really need you to tell three teachers that standing in the corner uh, of the playground with 60 kids and them looking at their phones, talking to each other is not active supervision. <laughs> and they're not fully go. aware of what's going on around them. So that piece needs work. Pattern recognition and abnormalities, I think, you know, again, you know, the research and experience, they're good at it because they live it every day. They recognize what's yes. normal. They're the experts. And then we get to the cognitive decision making under stress and we're stuck again. So the, those two end pieces, the, yep. you know, they're the ones that are the struggle. They're, I think we can nurture and support the pattern piece because they, they've got it there. They, they get it. I mean, how many times I've had people, oh, there's a stranger in the hallway. I knew something was up there. That car didn't belong at pickup and arrival. Hey, there's something yep. in that car in the back parking lot. They, 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 they lean they can always get better, right, through training. But they lean better in that direction. It's those other pieces that we're working on. And none of those things, right, have to do with the 85-page emergency plan. Yeah, no, yeah. You're exactly right. It's a, it's a human-to-human uh, uh, breakdown and failure that has been around since Plato. And, and that's why they used to sit on the steps and look face-to-face and solve these problems. And the thing is, it's okay to have an advocate in Congress. It's okay to have somebody write a law, but that doesn't mean it's enforceable. That doesn't mean mm-hmm. it's the most prudent decision when education and training are available all around you. And I like Brian as well. I like starting at the grassroots level and I start like regional training level. And I think everybody needs to be included, not just lose, a supervisor or a superintendent. Bit, oh, yeah, he's still yeah. there. Thank you. You got it. Am yeah. I back? Yeah, you're good. I, I can I can hear you. Can you still hear us, Ken? Yeah. So, sorry about that. Okay, so, great. Hey, if it's any better, it happens with CNN and Fox too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got gotcha. you. So I had, had a little, yeah, all good. I'll, I'll edit that out, but we, we had some, some audio issues there folks. And then, um, uh, Greg has a hard stop, but he, he had to, he had to kind of jump off, but you know, the kind of one other thing I wanted to ask you about was sort of this, this legal precedent that's been set with, with parents being, you know, held criminally negligent for the school shootings that were conducted by their kids, right? So, um, you know, it ha- already happened with a, a father in Georgia, the most recent one, and then we know Ethan Crumbly and his parents in um, in Oxford uh, High School in Michigan. So I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that because that obviously opens a whole legal door. 
um, and what you think in general when it comes to negligence on who's responsible, because a lot of people are just going to say, well, it's the school is responsible for the safety of the children, but they're also not given, like we talked about a lot of the resources or things to, to deal with these situations. So I just kind of want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I, I've seen this creep uh, uh, creeping up, and and it's intensifying. It's really hit a, a head here in the last this incident, and certainly with Uvalde, and other things that have happened that haven't captured uh, the extent of national attention. Is look, people are desperate for uh, and fed up. People are desperate and fed up. They're searching for accountability. They're demanding accountability. They're looking for somebody to blame. Yep. Whether and and in some cases there are legitimate places to blame, depending on the facts of each case. And and we've seen that with the uptick in, in civil litigation and on school safety in general. Um, as I say, I often get more calls in a month from superintendent uh, from attorneys than I do from superintendents. Lawsuits versus proactive stuff. I anecdotally, I think there's a correlation there. If you're not doing the training and you're not doing the proactive stuff. Right. Uh, anecdotally, I would think that, you know, you're probably higher risk for having uh, some liability. But this, so we've seen the uptick in, in the school security litigation piece of it. Uh, and not just shootings, but uh, rape, other sexual assaults, gang violence, uh, aggravated assault. So uh, all kinds of other cases uh, in addition to the shootings. It's not just limited to that. So mm -hmm. that's the call and, and the point to the schools. And now, and that still hasn't solved it, right? People are looking right. for it to solve, to end, to drop. And it's a wicked problem. We know from the research and literature on wicked, what wicked problems, there are no five things you could do and just stop and solve it. And if you do one thing on one side to address one piece, it affects the other end. So you have all these tentacles uh, yep. of the problem. So now the, the move is, okay, hold parents accountable. And hey, I am totally supportive of parental accountability. I think there's some huge gaps there in terms of why we see the things that we're seeing. Uh, the focus on the home, the parenting, the family structure, the family function or dysfunction, all are elements. But the parents now, let's bring in, them into play. And typically it's around access to the firearms. So that's the peg, the hole to, 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 yeah. to get them in. But then... Um, and I'm not saying we shouldn't have schools held accountable. I'm not saying we shouldn't have parents held accountable. Uh, what I am saying is when we continue to see school shootings in spite of those two things, we're still going to be grasping for accountability, right? The, go the reality is we work, and I've worked 40 years, and you've worked in your field. Everybody's working for risk elimination. The reality mm -hmm. is what we can achieve at best is risk reduction. And yep. we try to tighten that hole. And what's, the good news is, let's shine a little light here, is the good thing is schools are much better at, at, at threat assessment and preventing yes. uh, and, and in security than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. The bad news is we're dealing with human behavior. What, here we go again, right? Behavior. Yep. And you're when you're dealing with human behavior, you're going to slip through the cracks, whether that's alleged failures in human factors or whether that's not recognizing or the warning signs, whether that's not responding uh, to your to what expectations and, and appropriately when an incident occurs, it still comes back to human behavior. We, and we can't solve a behavior problem with a technology solution. Yeah, I I think that's a that's a good way to look at it. And um, you know, the again, um, you're never gonna you can't you can't prevent everything, right? You can't have a, a completely secure. Well, I'm not in living. You can't you can't have a completely secure you know, world and and live in a free society at the same time. So so you you you, you and you, but you don't you know my thing is like you you don't need to. Um, it, meaning you can you can greatly reduce some of these issues and some of the things that you see by getting people more involved and focusing on some of the things that matter and how you can control things within your own community. And like you said, even earlier, the, the what are the foundational elements? What is this? What are we building this on? What is what is the overall thing we're trying to achieve? Because there there are a lot of different solutions for that or, or different ways that are going to work depending on the type of school and the environment. I mean, it's just like any type of any other type of threat. It's going to be different everywhere you go. And in trying to over legislate something 
kind of ends up putting people in a box. Now they're forced to do something. Now it's like, well, I don't really have control. I have to do this. And now we're relying on these technological solutions. And you brought up all the different drawbacks to that. And it's just we're, we're creating a massive industry and process and system without addressing those key factors. Well, schools aren't schools aren't factories. They're not right. city hall. They're not federal office buildings. They're not military installations. They're not uh, you know your your major corporation and and uh, and plant and factory. Uh, they are community centers, and they're community centers not only for kids who come in and represent a microcosm of the broader community and the good, the bad, and the challenges that come with that, uh, but they're also community centers after school in the evenings. I mean, they're the heart of many small communities, many yep. mid-sized communities, many big communities where that's the heart of activities for after school, performing arts, athletics, community use of schools, recreation centers, uh, uh, you know, senior meetings, uh, what you, whatever it is. Schools that you talk to a school custodian and they, I say, well, you have an alarm system on your, you know, uh, what time do you typically turn it off? I say Sunday night for four hours because the building's open <laughs> and yeah. you've got cleaning people. And he said, the buildings are open 10 o'clock at night, six to seven days a week in a good, in a high school. On average, that's what we hear 10 o'clock at night. So somebody's using that beyond the academic day. So it's not a sterile environment. It's not a TSA and airport. And you right. have to look at that context, the purpose, the function, what fits reasonable technology support, but it's a supplement too, but not a substitute for the human factors again. Um, yeah. and, and until we, you know, we button that up and, and, and recognize that and have, and say what parents want to know two things or should want to know two things. Parents want to know two things. Number one, what do you have in place to reduce the risks? And number two, how well prepared are you to manage something you can't prevent? Yeah. And, and that's a, that's a great, starting point too and, and engaging those people uh in the community as well to to get on board with this and i always tell people and no matter where i'm at whether we're working with a private company law enforcement schools it's like look you have a lot more say in this than you than you're, than you're right. recognizing like you you are if you're in charge here then be in charge and and say this is what we're going to do and there's obviously a lot of fear with that because people don't want to think think you know they don't want to make the wrong decision it's like okay but you know, it, it, making a decision and articulating why you did it and saying these are our policies, you have you have one, you have a legal leg to stand on if it fits in line with what, what are common accepted practices. And you can you can make it, you know, uh, uh, local to your community. You can you can modify what you need to, given the resources and and tools that you have. So um, that's why they say I, there's a saying if you've seen one school, if you've done an assessment on one school, you've seen one school, you've seen one school. And it's kind of like that with one school shootings. You've seen one school yep. shooting. You've seen one because the fact patterns are, are different. But it comes down with bottom line is when security works, it's because of people. When it fails, yep. it's because of people. And, yep. we have, and people it equates to behaviors. Yep. Well, I, I obviously completely agree <laughs> agree with that because that's our, our whole approach. But um. I'm going to have a, a bunch of bunch of links and the episode details so people can, you know, get in touch with you and go to your website and everything. But, um, you know, what's the best way for folks that that want to reach out and get a hold of you or have you at their school or find out more? What's the best way to do that? Yeah. Easiest way to reach out to the website, schoolsecurity.org. You know, Ken at schoolsecurity.org. Get back to everybody. Uh, also on LinkedIn. I do a lot yeah. of posts. Doing a lot more in depth as far as the social platforms on LinkedIn. You can find me there, connect, try to put some more detailed things to stimulate thoughts and uh, fuel that almost daily. Yeah. And I, I'll put that link in the details as well, because that's where we kind of first came across you a while back. And I've been following your what you're posting because I, I think it's great. There's a ton of information in there. And even just a way to look at some of these things, you're giving some really good thinking points for parents, administrators, anyone in the industry to think about and and getting and you're backing it up with data and what we actually know, not what the news story is out there or what someone's story of being involved with that with their children, which is heartbreaking, but at the same time, I'm, like I, I get it, but that might, you know, that that might not be the right thing to to do in this in this situation. Critical thinking, <laughs> absolutely. Critical thinking. Can't, can't say it enough. We got to learn how to do that, though. So that's obviously where where we come into play and what what we love doing. But uh, I, I really sing it from the same sheet of music and enjoy talking with you guys. 
Absolutely, Ken. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your time. We'll follow up with you and 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 keep the keep the conversation going. We kind of actually wanted to have a, a follow on discussion with with Joan Johnson too on the podcast. We've had her on a while back um, to to get into some of this with the decision making and her area of expertise because she's brilliant. And um, hopefully, uh, have her on as well. She is. We spent about an hour and a half for what we thought would be a very short conversation, and and yeah. realized we need more. So uh, we're continuing that conversation. So I, th- I think we're all in the singing from the same sheet of music and we just need to build a bigger choir. Yep. Well, that's great. Well, thanks so much for, for coming on, Ken. I know you're a busy guy and, uh, and the schedule is just a suggestion. So, uh, as you, as you, you told us, which I agree with. So we, we thank you. Thank you for your time and keep up the work and we'll, we'll, we'll be, we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks to you and Greg as well, Brian. Take care. Thanks, Ken.